Peace, family. I welcome you all in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm LJ, a student of the Word, here to share some very important information. I thank you all for taking some time to watch this, especially if you know me personally. It really means a lot because the truth is everything to me. I love you all and pray that God gives us even more understanding and revelation. One of the things I used to think about when I was younger, and I'm sure has come across everybody's mind, is that after the end of this world, when we finally get to eternity, at some point in time will we get bored or will we run out of things to do? You know, this is something that people think about. I did for a long time. But then I read this scripture right here and truly valuing the whole chapter of Psalm 147. But in verse 5 it says, God's understanding is infinite. I put a lot of thought into this and what this means is that there is no end or no limit in respect to his knowledge and how much he can acquire. So when we finally see him face to face, we will always have something more to learn and something new to explore in the mind that is God. If we just look at this earth, all the variety of life and nature and how beautiful and complex it all is, that by itself can't even be fully understood by man. And I'm not even talking about the heavens and all the cosmos above us. That's just a whole different world. In this life, we understand that we are looking through a glass darkly, meaning it's so much that we just can't see. Our understanding is extremely small and next to nothing compared to the infinite amount of knowledge that God has. And it's just amazing that he has given us access to this knowledge. But even at this point in time, we are barely scratching the surface. We can never fully understand in this life. So we can rest assured that when we reach our final destination with the Lord, we will be eternally satisfied because his understanding is infinite. When we really think about it, what this means is that even God himself probably doesn't know how much he knows. That's the only way his understanding can be infinite because infinity has no bounds. There is no end to it. So if God could search out the end of his own understanding, then it wouldn't be infinite anymore, right? So all the hard questions that we can ask, the ones that sadly the mainstream church has failed to answer, the answers are there, real, logical, satisfying answers that are plain and simple and reasonable to understand. More importantly, they are right and is true to them that seek God and find that knowledge. I won't really get into why we should only be using the King James Bible with a word study dictionary. But I will say that all the other so-called Bible versions and new translations after the original translation authorized in 1611 cannot be called the Word of God because they add, take away from, and completely change the whole history of our Creator. And unless you study for yourself every word that was perfectly placed for our understanding, then you will be deceived by the false doctrines that come from the confusion in those books. Yes, they have a little truth in them, but even if it was one tiny change, it would ruin the whole story. This is why we have so many other religions and denominations when we all should be teaching and believing the same thing. We all should have the same mind because there is only one spirit that leads to all truth. There is only one complete word of God confirming itself from beginning to end with everything connecting perfectly, like a symphony in perfect harmony. None of those other worldly Bibles do that. They sow discord with incorrect notes, just destroying the whole song. All it takes is just a little research and comparing to see for yourself. The Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle, and you have to fit the pieces together to get the full picture. And as humans, we want everything to fit together perfect, like watching a movie in sequential order. But that's just not how it is sometimes. But when we actually take time to study and research to put all the pieces together correctly, then we finally see the big picture. So what is the word? The word is genetics. It is a programming language. And when we talk about genes and genetics, the very first book in the Bible is called Genesis, deriving from the Greek word genomai, meaning to come into being or existence, to happen, to become, of events, to be made. And from this word genomai, we get other related words like genes and genetics, generation, genealogy, genos, meaning race or nation, and to beget or begotten, which is a very important word in the Bible. All of these words have the implication or the direct meaning of reproduction, which is the action or process of making a copy of something. So what is the Bible really about? And this we can understand from the title of the very first book, the first word that we read, which is the word Genesis. This gives us an indication as to what the story will be about, and it is about the process of reproduction. Now we ask, who is being reproduced, what type of reproduction, and why? The answers to these questions will tell us exactly what the Bible is about and the very purpose of creation and what God is really doing. The story of the Bible from beginning to end is a love story about the reproduction of God. 
He set this whole process in motion a long time ago with wisdom and careful planning. And it was done with the intent to make more of himself. And that involves genetics. But when people think about genetics, they think that it's cells, atoms, or molecules, something that is material or made of matter. And that's not what it is at all, not in the Bible and not even in science. Genetics is actually a programming language, information that can be calculated like a mathematical formula or a code that produces something material or tangible, but the formula itself is immaterial. In the book of John chapter 1 we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This is saying that the basis of everything that exists is a programming language called the Word that is God, the building blocks of everything. We exist as information. When we dig deeper into this, we will see what else this word of God can do. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, God said that he would put his laws in our hearts and in our minds, he will write them. So God was going to program his children according to his word, his law and his characteristics. But this all would happen as a process, a lifelong painful process. The word is the genetics of God, a pure language that defines God. And at the same time, it is all God. It would then define everything else he creates, including the biological programming behind all life forms. So God himself had to be defined first in order for him to reproduce himself. He had to write a language that would represent everything he is. And when that language was made visible, the full expression or image that came forth was Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The phrase only begotten is the Greek word monogenes, which I will get into in a minute, but it has the word gene in it, referring to genetics. It is from the root word genomai. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I myself am a computer draftsman and a graphic artist. And in order for me to draw or construct an image of a three-dimensional object like a cube on the computer, I don't just draw it on the screen. I have to use a program to type in a formula or a code, some numbers to give the program a command. And after all the input is entered, the full expression of what was written is produced on the screen as the image of the cube. So what we are looking at is a three-dimensional cube, but in reality, it is a bunch of letters and numbers put together forming a code. A language. This is also how game coding is, how the characters and the worlds they live in are built. We can learn a lot from coding because this is how our reality works according to the Word of God. The Bible tells us that all things were made by the Word, and without the Word nothing could exist. Everything has an underlying definition written in it, whether it is a stone or a tree or the wind, the earth or the heavens. They all have a coding that gives it a definition for it to exist. God is the one and only programmer who wrote the software for all things to be what they are. And without this intelligence first having existed, nothing would have come into existence. So essentially, we are made up of information called the Word. The intelligence that is God, who is intangible, occupies no space, and not consistent of any matter, yet everything exists inside of Him. And we are living in Heaven's movie. God wrote the script and all the characters that were play in it. Earth represents flesh, and heaven represents spirit. We have spirit beings, we have flesh and blood beings. Now why did God create everything? The Bible says, not only was all things created by him, but everything was created for him, for his pleasure, and also for his pain. The purpose of creation is for God to reproduce himself, for him to have a family that could relate to him. They would be just like him in every way, everything that is good. We read before in the Psalms that his understanding is infinite. God is a infinitely complex being. So it is without question that the process of his reproduction would also be very complex. It would be carefully designed and detailed to perfection. It wouldn't be so simple like just snapping his fingers and suddenly he has a whole family of himself. No, God is not like man that he has a body. This was not a physical process at all. He had to replicate his own character and characteristics his mind, his thoughts, his motivations, his feelings, everything that makes God who he is would have to be programmed in his begotten children. 
that is where the complexity comes in. To reproduce characteristics, you have to literally show them to a person like a child learning from their parents by observing them and the child repeats what they see. So first, God had to reveal his own characteristics to his creation. And secondly, he had to have a certain type of creature who those characteristics will be reproduced in. That creature is man. This is what man is, that the mind of God is full of the thoughts of man. It is God replicating himself in man, transforming him into a entire new creature. Now, when we look at this world and see all the evil and suffering, we might think to ourselves, why does it have to be like this? And did God really know what he was doing? Is this all in his plan? But all through scripture, he shows us that he knew exactly what he was doing. And it all was planned even before he made the earth. It is all in his will. Like I said before, God has written a movie. And we know in any movie, you have a protagonist and an antagonist. You have good guys and bad guys. So God made people that were going to become evil, and he made people that are destined to be good, like he is good. But only he knows who they are, and they have no control over their roles, the writer does. This is where the idea of free will contradicts scripture and creates a false doctrine, especially how Hollywood promotes it. Yes, we do have a will and the freedom of choice, which are two different things, but our will is not free. Only God has free will meaning the freedom to purpose whatever he wants. But we are required to make choices with the limited will God gave us. But even our choices are guided by the sovereign will of God, the creator. Just look at the plain words of the covenant God commanded Moses to make with Israel when they were in Moab. And in Romans 9, it explains that God is the potter and we are the clay. He uses that clay for his purpose. Those who love God and seek his face continually make their calling and election sure. Then his purpose for us is revealed. So the world was absolutely planned to be the way it is because it is in a world that has gotten so evil that God would show his power and his own character. He would reveal himself, his deepest part of his being, which is his love. He proved it to us. And the only way to prove something, we know that it has to be tested. It has to go through trials and endure opposition. Evil serves the purpose of challenging God's power. It is to put God's love to the test. And it turned out that the love of God is the most powerful force that can ever exist because it even conquered death by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People don't realize that this wasn't an easy thing because death is an opponent that was made equally as strong as love, the Bible tells us. And the victory over death is the revelation that would program us with that love. This is how God would write his laws in our hearts and minds by showing them to us. And the ultimate expression of his character in person is Jesus Christ. Now we know that the word is what defines God, right? So if we were to define God in words, how would we do that? I would define him as a conscious, intelligent being with a conscience. This is just a simple definition and not the extent of his knowledge or his understanding, because he is so much more, but it is the person that is God. He is life himself, and aware of everything. He is intelligence, he is logic and understanding, reason, he plans and forms complex ideas. And finally, God has a conscience, which is the power to determine and fully understand what is right and wrong, what he is and what he is not, meaning he computes information in terms of good and evil, yet he is all good. And a lot of people have a problem with accepting this because this means that he would then sit in judgment upon things that are considered to be evil by him and not us. People just don't like to be told that they are wrong and that they need a guide to know what is good. The world today is calling right wrong and wrong right. God is reasonable, so he gave us a perfect manual that has been preserved and translated in the most common language in the world today words to live by and learn about him and his story, which is why we call it history. So these same three characteristics would needed to be reproduced in any offspring that God would beget, and they are needed to make a person a person. It is consciousness, intelligence, and a conscience. In Genesis chapter 2, where God was going to make the man Adam a help that was meat for him, he made him one of his own kind. After God formed all the animals, he didn't give Adam an ape or a monkey or any other kind of creature. He made him someone that was of his own species, somebody that could love him equally. This is the same with God. He wanted a companion that would give him joy and able to love on his level. So why would he accept anybody that would be less than him? He wanted somebody of his own kind. 
So in the process of time, with a lot of pain and suffering, as a matter of fact, all of it, including death itself, God would have to endure it with patience to finally one day have his family of children who would have been transformed into the image of his son, Jesus, which is a new creature that contains the person of God, the creator. The word reproduce or to beget, when we talk about genetics and genesis and generations, it implies a copy from an original. And since the original is God, the copy that would be produced would also be God because he was the prototype. And Jesus is called the archetype from which we have been born again and chosen to be his archetypes. He is the firstborn of the many brethren. When people think of reproduction, they think of the body and a physical action. But God did not reproduce his body because he didn't have one to begin with. God is a spirit. We can read in Hebrews 10, 5 that sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. The body plays a very important role in all of this, but that body was not a reproduction. He created the original body from scratch. So God's reproduction had to be of a spiritual and intellectual nature. He would need to reproduce his mind and his spirit in the bodies of his children. To reproduce a body is really nothing for God because in Genesis 2, he takes the dust of the ground and he makes a body. It's that simple. Even today, man has acquired enough knowledge of genetics and cloning that it really wouldn't be a big deal to construct a body from almost anything. So God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and man became a living soul, receiving consciousness. And the Bible does imply that everything has a form of consciousness. We read about the stones crying out, and the mountains singing, and trees clapping their hands. But consciousness and intelligence are not the same thing. All things that are conscious are not intelligent. And an offspring of God would need both. Some people equate the person with the body. But you know, the body of Adam did not become a person until God breathed life into him and he became a living soul. The body is the vessel or house for the soul. But they are two separate things. Before the breath of life entered that body, it was not a soul. It wasn't conscious and it wasn't intelligent yet. These characteristics are immaterial and of a spiritual nature. The body is material. Now the word soul in Hebrew is the word nefesh. It literally means breath. Man became a living, breathing, conscious entity that is housed in a body made from the earth. Now when we look at this word soul in the New Testament Greek, we see the word suke. And from this we get the word psyche and psychology. This word lets us know that the soul is more than just consciousness, being awake and aware. It signifies the psyche, the mind and intelligence. Every soul has a measure of intelligence. Now, two of those three characteristics of God were already fulfilled in man by Genesis 2-7. The breath of life made Adam awake and aware. It also made him intelligent. We know this because he was able to dress and keep the garden, and he gave all the animals their names. You got to be very intelligent to do something like that. No, it was something that Adam did not have at this point in time that he absolutely needed in order for God to reveal himself, for mankind to become God-kind. He needed this God-like ability for the creator to replicate himself in man. What Adam lacked was a conscience. Now this is something that people in general haven't given much thought to and they think man was some kind of spiritual or celestial God-like creature before the fall. But the fact is, before they both ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve did not have a conscience yet. Because a conscience is the ability we have that allows us to analyze information in terms of good or evil. This is what makes us spiritual and become as gods, the Bible tells us. It is knowledge, not any physical powers or other abilities, but the power to operate using the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. This is another deep subject that I will have to explain and confirm with scripture in another video, God willing. But even though there are many gods, the Bible says, it does not make them the one creator and father whose name is Jehovah in English. This is a very important topic and the reason why that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was put in the garden. It is only by having a conscience that man can know and understand God and then become his children by being transformed from evil man to good God Almighty. This plain understanding makes so much sense to me because everything that God does makes perfect sense but we just have to have the sense to understand and accept it. Obviously, I can't cram all of this study and research in one video. It's just too much and would take a lifetime, but everything fits together like a perfect puzzle. Now, the word conscience in Greek is the word sunitis. The last part of that word, itis, 
is where we get the word idea from, also prolonging from the word sunarajo and sunaido. This means to see and to know. And in terms of conscience, it is co-perception and co-knowledge. Co meaning something that you are aligning yourself with from the knowledge of it. Your mind being governed by aligning with the knowledge of either good or evil. And the simple definition here says the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad, prompting to do the former and shun the latter, commending one and condemning the other. Jesus said no man can serve two masters, either he will hate one and love the other. We cannot serve God and the things of this world that will always lead to evil. So God made Adam and Eve and put them in this garden named Eden. And there were two trees that were identified in the Bible. One was a tree of life, which only has significance when there is death. And the other was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, I used to always wonder why God would plant this tree that contained knowledge of evil along with good. And one of the most obvious answers is that without the knowledge of evil, it is impossible to know God who is all good. Man was chosen to be the vessel in whom God would eventually reproduce himself in. And this is a process that involves the conscience. Adam was not the reproduction of God. He was only the blank sheet that would be written upon. And when the writing was finished, what would come forth is the person we call Jesus Christ. He is the reproduction of God, the finished product. Now, in regards to Jesus Christ being the image of God, there is a misunderstanding that most people have when reading Genesis 1:27, where it says that man was created in the image of God. And people apply this to Adam and Eve and even to themselves. But that is incorrect according to the scriptures. The first person who was created in the image of God is Jesus Christ. And this we understand from Hebrews 1.3 that says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Adam was not the image because God's personality and character had not been written upon him yet. The phrase express image is the Greek word character, literally meaning character. And God's image or character has to be written it has to be inscribed in us. The word scribe meaning to write and the word inscribe or engrave means to write inside or within making a permanent impression. For example, a seal stamped on wax showing the image of that seal or a trophy that has a name inscribed or engraved in it, not just written on it. Right now, we bear the image of Adam, who is earthy man. Then over time, as the evil conscience is purged by the blood, we begin to change more and more into the image of Christ, who is the image of God. As humans, we have children and we give birth to our own kind. And this is what God wanted to do. He wanted to give birth to more of his own kind, but he had to reproduce his own character. And that has happened in Jesus Christ. He was the first complete image of God. And that is something, again, that is not Adam because he did not have the character of God. But it was destined that out of Adam would come the one who would be the person of God. Now we follow after Christ. The copy has been done. And basically that same process of reproduction that happened in Jesus is being repeated in the ones chosen to be begotten of the Father. Right now, Jesus is called the only begotten and the firstborn of every creature. The term only begotten is the Greek word monogenes. The way it's spelled is monogenes. The word genes is in there. And genetics comes from this word that God reproduced and he wrote himself in that person using the genetic coding, the language we call the word. This is the whole process that was completed in Christ. It started a long, long time ago, even before the Garden of Eden. As a matter of fact, ages before man from Adam was created. I won't really get into the prehistory right now and all that happened, but there is a whole history in the gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, which I've talked about in a video I titled The Gap Fact. So basically this process began in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven, which is the city of God, and the earth. Then three different ages came and went in which evil was born and it grew and it was allowed to mature and become complete in so much that death became as strong as love. There are many scriptures confirming this. And finally, we get to Genesis 1, 2, where we find the earth without form and void with darkness, which is evil, covering it all. This all happened so that we will one day get to this time in that garden where there would be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if evil had not existed already in God's creation, there would have been no knowledge of evil, right? So therefore, God had to allow evil to come into existence before he could make this creature 
who would have a conscience. So this is where the understanding of genetics as far as the programming of the mind and heart, which represent the conscience, is concerned. When God set out to do this, he would use his own genetics to create a race of beings called the sons of God. Not the sons of God who are just men. They are begotten of God. Now there is a false doctrine that has been around since the days of the apostles that the sons of God in Job 38 and Genesis 6 are angels. But in Hebrews 1, it clearly states that angels cannot be sons. God has never called any angel son. They are spirit only and flames of fire, not flesh and blood, nor can they reproduce in any way. And this is another study for another time. So the word begotten is genaho in Greek. Again, the root word is gene, which is a programming language. So these begotten sons of God, Jesus Christ being the first one, the head, the archetype, are those creatures that God has reproduced himself in, spiritually and intellectually. That is the whole purpose. And the complex part of this whole process was the idea of the conscience, knowing good and evil, of how God, who was good, would reproduce that character of good in his children by using his opposite to educate them, giving them a perfect conscience, understanding evil, yet only being able to choose good. Now, when we say God is good, remember the scripture where Jesus says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. And most people get a little confused when they hear that. I know I was. But you know, literally what this means is that there is only one being in all creation that is absolutely good. And there can only be one. The Bible tells us that God cannot even be tempted with evil. Meaning he is completely and totally immune to it. This is a very important thing to understand about him. That God is not relatively good. Like how you might say someone is a good person. But we all understand that we are speaking relatively because none of us are perfect. Only God is. That he has never ever been evil and can never be evil. Because there is one problem with evil. That it contains within itself the seed of its own destruction. Once the tiniest particle of evil enters into a person, it will spread like a wildfire and eventually destroy the host. And the end of that destruction is death, which is the absence of life. And death is a state. It is not non-existence. There is no way around it. But it was necessary to bring us the knowledge of love. So the thing is that if God was ever even one micro particle of evil, one speck of darkness, in the end, it would destroy him and all of his creation. So this is what proves that he is from everlasting to everlasting, that he is self-sustaining, and he can only be like that by being absolutely good. He is the eternal spirit that raised Christ from the dead and will do the same for us. There is no other person anywhere in existence like that. So why would we ever want to follow anybody or anything else? It would all eventually lead to death. So knowing that he is absolutely good should make us put all our faith and trust in him, understanding that he will never fail us. Okay, now I'm about to tell you what the real gospel is, what this is all for, what we have to look forward to. And while I can have peace in the midst of the most severe storms, we just stated that God is absolutely good and he set out to reproduce himself, that he wanted more of his own kind. Because God is a spirit, Jesus told us, and we understand that God is an intelligent, conscious being with a conscience, but that doesn't mean that he is a physical person. God is information, an immaterial mind, you could say. And in that mind, there are thoughts. God tells us that he thinks. His thoughts are higher than ours. For example... God has the idea of flying through the heavens or swimming in the ocean, right? In order to experience that feeling, he would need something that is physical. And that's where the importance of the body comes in. That God, who is life, experiences life through his creation. That is why he created us all. Understanding that anything that is happening to us, he is experiencing it through us. Otherwise, it would only happen in his mind. Like in our minds, you know, we can think about going skydiving, for example. And we can even vividly dream about it. But no matter how hard you think about it, that actual experience of boarding a plane, flying up, and then jumping out of it will never be the same as what you had in your mind. So God is very near to us in so much that he lives through us and through our experiences. It is all happening to him. All the pain, suffering, anger, sadness, and all the happiness, joy, peace, and love. People say all kinds of things against God because they see so much evil being allowed. But they don't really understand that all of what they see and feel is actually happening to him. He is allowing it to happen to him. And he is enduring it all because he loves us and wants us to love. So God being the person that he is can experience multiple things simultaneously. He can enjoy exploring the deepest sea, traversing the densest jungle, 
while soaring through the heavens all at the same time in different vessels as one person. See, the thing is, he wants us to have that experience as well. He has prepared for us a house that is incorruptible and eternal that will not wear out or suffer pain and it won't be limited in any way, experiencing all things at the same time as the one person of God, which is incredible and something we just can't comprehend in our current state. That's why he said in thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We will be in an age where evil will be all done away with and we will finally be transformed into God's image, having his mind and heart, becoming life, becoming love, and God will dwell in all of us. It will be a time of peace and joy and excitement. This is what we have to look forward to. This is something that is more valuable than anything in this world. But you know, Satan the devil keeps our mind occupied on earthly things, keeping us from seeing what God wants to do for us. All right, so we know that God is absolutely good. This is what the Bible teaches us. And a true reproduction of God would also need to be absolutely good at the end of his transformation, which means immune and incapable of evil. And that is what God has done through this whole plan and process. It is what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has done for us. It is more than just giving us eternal life. It is a transformation of our mind and heart, purging our conscience from works that are evil to slowly over a lifetime change us into God. Then God will be all in all of us. He began this process in man in that garden, giving us a conscience. But that was just the beginning of the journey because the first conscience that they acquired was evil. It was the serpent's conscience. The devil called Satan who was the complete opposite of God. None of that was an accident that God had to fix later. It had to happen that way and it was all pre-planned by God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was to be slain from the foundations of the world. So even before any of these things happened with Adam and Eve, it was necessary for them to make the wrong choice first to be creatures of conscience. But before their conscience could become good like God's, it had to become evil first. In another teaching, I will explain the reason why evil had to come first in man. But the plan was always for the antidote or the cure to be provided that would purge that evil, removing it completely, like a computer's hard drive that crashed because a virus got introduced into it, then to administer the antivirus to remove it. Not just removing it, but bringing something else into it, writing a software program into it so that the virus could never infect that computer again. This is what the blood of Christ is really for. The power in it not only removes that evil from us, it makes it so that it can never enter into us again, that we can become absolutely good just like God. That is what makes us the begotten sons of God. It makes us worthy of being his heirs. God is not going to give his kingdom to creatures that are capable of bringing evil back into his creation. Like the angels that sinned and turned against him in the beginning, they didn't have the knowledge of evil, so it was inevitable that evil would eventually come in. But God can confidently give his begotten sons the kingdom, because like him, they can no longer be tempted with evil. This is the real good news, that not only will we have eternal life, we will be absolutely good like God. That we won't even be able to think about anything evil. It won't even be able to enter into our minds. That's how powerful the sacrifice of God is for us. It is to literally create in you a perfect conscience. And it's only by a miracle we can even begin to comprehend it because it is impossible to make somebody perfect, yet God has done it. So when we look at the road ahead of us, what we got to go through versus what has been really promised to us, it is so much more than I can't even begin to fathom. And this has nothing to do with material things or what heaven will be like and all the mansions that we will have or anything like that. But it is the person that we will be, who we will be transformed into, the person of God. And the word person in Greek is the word hypostasis, meaning substance. And I will do a deep study of the one person that is God. He is not three people in one when we understand what a person is. So we are literally like computers that are being programmed for a very specific purpose. And it is working in everybody's life, either for bad or for good. So without this incredible power of God, we would never have changed and we would never have chosen him. It is making us a better person and eventually it will make us a perfect person. The same person that is God. Those that are begotten of him who believe in Jesus Christ and are born again, who will stay the course and endure until the end, finishing their race to enter into eternal life. They will be a new race of beings that has come from the flesh and blood sons of God. But in Corinthians, we read that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. It is reserved for this new creature, a new species that is not humankind or mankind anymore, but he is God kind, a perfect union of spirit and flesh with the genes of God. I would advise you to go and study the King James Bible, meditate on all these scriptures, and definitely watch this several times because you will not get it all with just one or two views. We are programmed by repetition. 
Also, don't believe me. I'm a man who fails every day. Check me out and see if these things that I'm telling you are true. Look at the meanings of these words, because words are very important and very crucial to our belief of the truth. Understand what they mean to hear what God is telling us. Nothing has happened that has not been previously planned, and the end result was that God wanted to make more of himself. I will continue this study in another part, as this is a vast topic and the most significant I have ever been blessed to be able to comprehend. I'm just a student of the word, sharing what I have learned to those who have an ear to hear. Please open your heart and mind and receive the spirit of truth. Much love and God bless you all.